And uh, thank you everyone for coming to this webinar. I'm going to, uh, this will be recorded. It's going to be on ctstate.edu slash webinars with the slide deck. I'm going to ask you to put any questions in the chat. They'll be addressed at the end of the presentation. And I'm going to turn it over to Gail Parrott, the AVP of Enrollment and Retention Services. All right. Good morning, everyone. We are very happy to have you here. Um, after a long while, we are very happy and proud to share with you the electronic workflow for the course substitution form. Uh, this has been an enormous lift on behalf of IT, enrollment, our banner team um, to get this workflow um, ready for presentation. Uh, we do plan to move this workflow uh, live as of tomorrow, December 1st. And wanted to make sure we gave each of you um, a sneak preview of what to expect and how we've operationalized the paperwork form into the electronic work form that you're going to see this morning. Um, so with that in mind, I'm going to have our presenters announce themselves and give you an introduction, and then we'll get into our actual presentation. So oh, as Gail has already introduced herself, I'll go next since I'm second on the list. My name is Noelle Rosemelio, and I'm Manager of Enrollment Operations for CT State. And maybe we can go in order of our presenters this morning. Hello, everyone. Brian Capino, so I represent Guided Pathways Advising. Oh, Steve, I think you're muted if you want to try again. It wouldn't be an online presentation without someone doing that. I'm glad it was me. <laughs> Steve Mark, Department Chair, Arts and Humanities at the Housatonic Campus. Good morning, everyone. Tim St. James, Dean of Students and Faculty at Isnanta Campus. Um, good morning, everybody. Abdul Al Samurai, Degree Audit Technology Specialist. And we thank everybody for coming to present you know, each of their portions of how this electronic workflow will be running. Um, so just so you're just to kind of give you a background, this is really kind of the visual of the workflow for the course substitution form. Um, so the form has to start from somewhere. Um, so we are calling this person the initiator of the form. Um, and that will typically start from your guide pathways advisor or your faculty advisor on campus as they are the individuals typically meeting with that student, reviewing the degree works audit, um, and, and assessing if a course substitution may be applicable to that particular student. The form is accessible through self-service, and we'll walk through that shortly in our, in our demonstration. Uh, once the initiator submits that particular form, um, they have directed it to be sent to their department chair or program coordinator on campus who will be the first reviewer of that form. Uh, once that form has been reviewed, it is then moved forward to the campus dean of faculty or campus dean of students and faculty, however, set up on your particular campus to review. Uh, once that dean reviews it, and if it is approved, it is then finally moved to the degree audit team, who will then enter that substitution in the degree works audit. Um, at the conclusion of the review process, uh, if the uh, approval is completed, the student and whoever initiated that form, again, typically your guide pathway advisor or your faculty advisor, will then receive email notification of that. And we will give you um, uh, some sample emails of what that will look like. So the initiator, again, this is more uh, kind of behind the scenes of what these particular roles um, entail. So the, again, the initiator, typically the guide pathway or faculty advisor, work with, with the student to support and collect that information, reviews the degree audit, helps determine if a course substitution may be helpful to that student, and then route the form. Uh, whoever initiates that course substitution workflow will be CC'd in all emails to the student. So it, it is very helpful for it to start, especially with that advisor, so you are aware as well as your student in real time uh, what the status of that approval process is. As we also said, the campus department chair or program coordinator is that first reviewer and approver. Um, they will receive an email notification that there is a course substitution in their queue for review and approval. Uh, if the person does not respond to this, they will receive an email notification three days afterwards as a gentle reminder that that course substitution form is there for their review. Uh, the, the review option has obviously approval or not. Um, if the student, if you 
course substitution is approved, it then goes to the next person, which again is that campus dean of faculty or campus dean of students and faculty, and the same process would occur. The person will get an in email notification that there is a workflow item of course substitutions in their queue to re review and approve. And if it's not responded to, they will get an email reminder after three days as, as a gentle follow up. And finally, again, um, it lands with the degree audit team to update that substitution in the person's degree audit, and then the student will be notified through email. So step one, how this form is actually initiated or begun. So anybody who has advisor access in Banner will have advisor access to this card in my CT state, which is called the Advisor Online Forms card. And you'll see many things on there. First and foremost is the course substitution. So we also have options for fresh start, course overload, et cetera, but course substitution will be in production as of December 1st. And that is where the process begins. So again, you have to have advisor access in my in my CT state and in Banner in order to access this particular card through self service. So once you hit that particular button, um, you will be shown directly to the form, which is located in Highland. And now Brian will take you through the next steps in that process. Thank you, Gail. So once you land on on this form here, you'll see that you'll. Input the student's banner ID, uh, the name and the email address of the student will self populate as well. And you'll finish the remaining fields on the bottom portion of the form, which includes the CT state campus. As well as the CT state program before you move to the next slide. Once you're hit here, you'll need to input all of the course detail information, which includes a section number, the course description, as well as a justification. As Gail mentioned, you need to ensure that you put the campus DC's name and the college email address so we know who the next forwarded person in this workflow is going to. And you also need to ensure that you put your own name and the call your own college email address as the one who will receive the information as it's going through the pipeline and also when that final process has been approved. I'm going to turn it over now to my colleague Steve to go through the next portion of this. Thank you. So uh, I will come in and will be happy to not find this in my email anymore, <laughs> but in this new process. Um, and just a quick note for folks, we've all gotten accustomed to seeing this uh, yellow danger banner at the top of an email that comes from outside of our system. Um, so you may wanna check your other folder, uh, it may go to some people's junk folder just to make sure you're not missing any of these and, and reset your uh, parameters and filters accordingly. Uh, once I get to this screen, I'll be able to go in and by clicking on the link, you can see the red arrow there, review the form and the proposed course substitution right directly from within this program, which will bring me to the next step. So here's a place where you want to take a little bit of extra care because it unfortunately does not automatically populate each field. So you wanna make sure the email addresses are correct um, and give a double check before you send. Um, your email address, then your Dean of Faculty or Dean of Students and Faculty, depending on what structure your campus has, and also entering their email address here. Um, another note for department chairs or people at this stage of the game is once you approve or decline to approve, the student will be notified. So if you have questions about this course substitution, you're not so sure it, you're going to approve it, um, don't decline it and then send it out and then talk to your colleague about it. Talk to them first before you make a decision because the student will be notified and that of course will set off a chain reaction from there. So, and then your step in the process is done, department chairs. And just a brief, um, th so this is actually great and it's, it is key sensitive. So that's a great point of making sure you're, you're very clearly documenting who it should be sent to. Um, I just want to make sure that the folks are aware that you will see all the information on the course substitution form. We did not replicate it for this particular presentation. So you will see the information, the course, the description, and the justification for the substitution. So you will have all the information you need in order to make that approval. And then if you approve, you'll send it on to your Dean, who's next. 
Thank you. All right. So if everything has gone, uh, you know, to plan at this point and has been approved, um, it'll be the dean's uh, or the dean's designee uh, to opportunity to approve and review the information. The first step would be to, again, receive the email, click on the link to review the form, and then that'll take you to the next slide. Oh, did I, I'm sorry. Back it up. Sorry. I it's okay. jumped again there. You go right. It's okay. Sorry. And again, this will be the opportunity to review the academic information that was provided by whoever initiated it, review all appropriate signatures. And again, as Gail mentioned earlier, uh, the screenshot right now doesn't show, you know, give everything, but when you do click on it, you will see uh, all the academic information that was provided, uh, who had signed off up to that point, and you can then ensure that all the necessary and appropriate uh, signatures were were provided. Um, there's a couple things that we want to make sure, as I just mentioned. But you know, uh, when we talk about designees, it's really important that um, any time, if if you're the dean who would be approving these substitutions, if you you or any of the program coordinators or department chairs who may be away for an extended period of time and unable to participate in the process, it's best that you communicate widely across your campus who would be your designee so that the process can continue in your absence. Um, and then the other thing that's really important is that on each campus, we wanna make sure that we are promoting and informing everyone as to who the appropriate department chairs and program coordinators are uh, so you're, everyone is aware of the academic structure. But if everything looks good, then we will approve, um, and that would be the end of this 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 portion. Um, Gail, I think you wanted to mention something here about the TAP, if it was a TAP yes, program. Yes, thank you. Yeah, and I know Abdul is going to discuss it as well. Um, so the workflow is designed to be internal through CT State, um, but there is also going to be a question occasionally if there's a course substitution for a TAP program. Um, so Abdul, I don't know if you want to touch base on this and your portion of this presentation or I can take it. It's up to you. It's, um, it's completely up to you. I okay. you could go ahead since you sure. started. So we could go All ahead. right. So for, if a student is in a TAP program and there is a course substitution, uh, we would ask that that information that has been reviewed by the campus and approved by the Director of Transfer and Articulation with CSCU, who is Steve Marcellinus, um, has done this prior to submitting it for approval because it really does need to be in concert if it's a TAP program. And we are asking you put that information in the justification section of the form. So if that information is not there, the degree works team will, will follow up with the dean to verify that that has been done before the course of substitution will be put into place. And Abdul, I will turn it over to you. Sure. Um, so after all the approvals or after um, department chairs and PCs sign off on the course substitution, it will get to us, the degree audit technology specialist. Um, what we do, we process the course substitution. And um, as far as I, um, I understand on Highland, there is a button to click, which is complete. Once I hit that or any of the team hits the um, the complete button, then the system will send an email to the students and all the individuals who were tagged on this course substitution. Um, and that's basically it, how to verify that the course substitution was processed. As I mentioned, there is an email and also you could check in on through degree works and you could see through the degree that the course substitution was processed by one of us and you will see the day and, um, and, and um, that, that's basically it from our end. We just process the substitution. Right, thank you, Abdul. Thank you. So the next part, what's really exciting about these forms, uh, the electronic forms, and one of the positives is that we can set up automatic communications to the students and the initiators. So we wanted to be able to give you some examples of those automatic communications, keeping them simple for the student. Um, so when those the, through the process, when the student is ex that substitution is, is accepted that Abdul was just talking about that process. An automatic email will go to the student 
but also lets the initiator know that it's been processed and it's been accepted. So, and it gives the instructions for the students to be able to log into the MyCT State and their degree works to be able to see that because it will be in there. And then also allows them, if they have any questions, so please go back to their faculty advisor or their guided pathways advisor about enrollment and enrollment options for them or classes if they have questions. Just a simple message, but it also triggers that indicator back to that initiator, which is really exciting. Um, the other part of this is the denial side. If a student is denied at any part of the substitution, is the substitution is denied actually, um, a denial email will go to the student and also the initiator to let them know that there needs to be additional options. Again, as we've talked about uh, as the dean and the, uh, the department chairs said, again, it's really important, just like if you have the piece of paper in your hand, right, that you're having those discussions and you're questioning, don't just hit approve or accept um, or deny, is to make sure you're asking those questions if you need to call the advisor or the department chair back or so on. It allows us to be able to do that before we press that button, because once you press that button and submit, that automatic email does go out to the student and the initiator. So these are just some of those examples. Some key takeaways also for this is that we want to make sure that the, that each campus needs to maintain the list of the department chairs and the campus deans. That's why it's not an automatic field that can come in because that is sometimes constantly changing. And it really comes down to the email only, this initial process will only happen if the information in there is correct. So make sure as the initiator, you have an updated list. It's really important for the campus levels to have that because whoever you put in as that initiator is going to be the one that is going to be that, I'm sorry, as that approver, the first one is going to be the one that starts the process and gets the email. So we know human error happens. So we want to make sure that that's an important thing to focus on. Um, we also want to make sure uh, that you, uh, again, put that information in there. But I know there's been some stuff in the ch uh, chat about what if someone's out. That's a great question. If a department chair and dean or somebody that's our approver is going to be out maybe over the summer or on sabbatical or so on, there needs to be an initiator that is uh, designated for that campus. So that's an internal conversation for the campuses to have. Those initiators should have that updated information. So when they're putting in an email, they will know who to put into there so the student is serviced properly. So it looks like we're to the question section of, uh, of this. And I know uh, there seems to be some same questions, so I'm gonna kind of group them together a little bit um, and we can see if we can answer them as much as we can for you. Um, one of the questions was, are we going to be able to get like a cheat sheet or a reference? And we will be able to, the good thing, this is recorded. This has the presentation. We can get the presentation to uh, the staff, initiating staff that's on the call. We can be able to get the presentation so they can see how to walk through. It's pretty simple and self-explanatory once it walks up, uh, pops up, but definitely you can utilize this presentation as a resource for that. Um, the big question I keep getting, so I'm going to kind of put this one together, there's like three or four in there, about PCs and DCs being the initiator on that. So as Gail said, if the initiator, if they have access to the advising card, they can have access. Anybody who has access to that advising side, and we did have the question if someone is does not have access as a D DC or PC, can they get access and how they would they go about that is one of the questions on here. Sure, and so I think there's a couple there's a couple different questions in there. So I want to make sure we're we're kind of touching base on all of them. So so I want to kind of go back to kind of the the cheat sheet or the or the the guide portion, and we'll kind of work our way through. So uh, we decided not to do a live demo at this forum for the simple reason that it is there is some timing to it. What the demo in itself will take probably closer to an hour uh, because there is a lag time, I believe, of roughly 15 minutes from the time the person submits the substitution to the um, receipt of the initial email. Um, so that's why we didn't do a live demo, but but it really is a very self-explanatory process. It's very it, you have. You only need to have access to the link. You don't need to log into Highland. It's just you you click on the link and that secure email that you received. You follow the required steps and, and you approve or, or don't based on the documentation that you've received. Um, to answer your question regarding advisor access, if you have degree access now, access to degree works now, you will have access to this form. So essentially, if you have degree works access already um, based on your role at the campus, you would already have access to this form um, in my CT state. 
Um, there are different, I think, philosophies and discussions regarding who should initiate the form. Um, I know that Brian was going to talk about the, the importance of advising in this particular role. So I, I will turn it to, to Brian to address that portion. Yeah, and we really, we, you know, again, we wanted to figure out who were the best initiators of this form and it's, it's really advisors overall and especially because GPA as well are, are, are staff that are available on campus and on ground year round for students can be able to initiate this process for students. Students have the most access to those people at, at any one time. We felt that that was one of the best areas to kind of have the initiation start from. Considering that it was well, would be talking with an advisor about what to do moving forward. So that's the that's the reasoning behind um, really initiating coming from the advising portion of this uh, of this form. Thank you. Uh, next question: Does the PC and DC both have to approve the substitution? Yeah, and that's a great question. I think it depends on the structure of your campus and how you've designed your internal processes. I, so I, I would leave that more of a campus based decision of how you wish to address that. Um, but I would also say this is why it's important to have a clear list on your campus who to send these approvals to. So whoever is initiating the form has the accurate up to date list as far as the starting point. And then the Dean is ultimately your ending point before it goes to the degree works team. I, I suspect that varies a bit from campus to campus how that works currently. Thank you. Um, and then we have a question about uh, why do certain fields don't self populate? So, um, I can, if you don't mind, I don't mind taking that just because working no, with John absolutely. and Rusty on this. Again, some of this information is e easy to self populate, but program and so on, maybe they're like they have multiple programs a student is working on, or um, college wise, they might be looking, they might be sitting at another campus. So, we, we've uh, populated the ones we can through this process and can always relook at it if, if technology changes. But that is why the reason why some of them are not self populating. It makes it a little bit more confusing. And if changes happen so often, it might make it difficult to update the, the, the technology too. Um, just want to, uh, next question, which course subfields are required versus what are optional? So the ones on the form, anything that is required, of course, has the red, um, asterisk next to it and is required. And the reason by behind some of these, and again, they followed this up with the suggestion why course description is not optional. I think, um, it allows for our PCs and DCs just to have a starting point. Uh, so we have asked to have that put in there so that we can understand having the full playing field with that. If anybody has anything else to add to that, please let me know. Um, and then the question is, how does the process occur when faculty PCs and DCs are off contract for the summer and will buy, uh, will, will it automatically bypass directly to the deans? Yeah, and I think that's again one of the key takeaways is that your campus needs to have that plan for when fa when faculty are off contract, how to address this, uh, because the initiator needs to know who to send this form to for approval. Um, it's not intuitive. I wish it was, uh, but we need to know I, your campus will need to know if the PC for a certain program is off contract or has a medical emergency and is off campus. Life happens, you know, the, the campus needs to have that plan in place. So the, whoever initiates the form knows who that appropriate person send to. Um, as that designee in the individual's absence. So that was really up to your campus to determine your action plan for who to send to in case of, you know, absence, emergency, off contract, et cetera. And the next question was, is there a reminder or a indicator to that someone is, something is waiting in someone's email box? To... Yes, so the person will get an initial email letting them know that they have something in the queue and they will have a reminder three days later. Uh, we also, um, Noelle, as well as Jean Main, have the ability to go into the forms at large and, and see if any forms have been there for a significant period of time, and we can also reach out to individuals. But I would say you, know, at, you will get a minimum of two email reminders that you have something in your queue for review and approval. If a, core, if a student needs more than one course sub, does a separate form need to be submitted for each course sub? Yes. Yes, it does. And the, and the reason for that is because the routing could be different. 
um, if it's if it's under if you're asking for a course of under one discipline and a course of under a different discipline, the individual reviewing it could be two different people. So there is the rationale for why a, a course that would be different. Um, this question again, we might need to come back to and answer with this, but will uh, program chair uh, program directors have access to transcripts from other colleges? Uh, I believe again, if you have access to degree works, you should be able to see transfer option transfer credit. And I, don't, I believe that's available. But are you looking for specific transcripts themselves? And we, we may need to reach out to that individual for more clarity on the question. Yeah, I'll, I'll take down the name and we can definitely do that. Yeah. Um, is there a place on the form to state the course grade? Some selective admissions programs will need will need to have a legacy or better. To transfer on the course form itself, I don't believe there's a grade on there, but that is handled through the transcript evaluation process rather than the course substitution process. Um, when we enter a department chair, will the form populate their email address automatically? I wish it would. I really do. Um, unfortunately, it, it will not, which is why making sure you are being very deliberate as far as who you are emailing to. Um, for example, if we have a faculty member and a community college student that have very similar names, you need to be really careful who you're emailing it to uh, because the, the it is not the form itself is not intuitive to automatically populate an email address based on the name that you have entered. Um, the next question, I think it's similar to the other one, but I'm just going to ask it just in case it's a little different. Who sends out the reminder if the form is not signed or moved forward? It's an, it's an automatic email and it comes directly from Highland. Is there a place to attach a uh, course description? I do not believe so. Noelle, is that correct? It's there's not to attach. You have to put the description in automatically, so you can cut and paste it right from from catalog or anything. You can the, that capability is there. So yes, it will be there. What the description should be there from the initiator um, when you get it as a PC or DC and as a dean. It should be on the form and you can see it because it's a required field. There's a couple of very specific questions about campus stuff, so it's not to say that we are ignoring those. So I just want everyone to understand that I'm going to take those back so we can get very specific answers for your campuses, if that's okay. So I didn't want you to think we're skipping over it. Um, and very specific by programs such as cybersecurity and gen ed. So I want to make sure we can address those properly by program. Um, let's see. And a lot of people are answering that if you have access as, as a degree works, you should have access to certain things. Correct. Will we be reconsidering requiring section numbers? Information is not available on degree works worksheet. Uh, yes, we certainly can. So I think the, the most important thing we need to do is get the electronic workflow in production. I think we can all agree that the paper form is a laborious process. So I think having the electronic workflow in place would be a huge improvement. We can certainly work with IT after we've had it in production for a bit to see what particular improvements or modifications we need to make uh, for version 2.0. Um, but the for, for Version 1.0, which we have currently, um, it will be as it currently stands, and we can certainly um, revisit it and look to improve it down the road. And that just answers the next question. Will there be a review of equity and consistency through campuses just to make sure that the form is properly working? Yes, so. we, we will be reviewing all the forms that are related to enrollment services on a yearly basis just to make sure the forms are working appropriately, uh, modifying as needed, and this is certainly on the, on the list of forms to be reviewing in, in a partnership. Uh, with academic affairs as it does relate to the student's academic history. Is it possible to add uh, a section where it says, is the student enrolled in TAP? That might be a, a version 2.0 option. Um, that would add another step to the workflow, which does not currently exist. So again, that's, that's something we have to work with IT um, to see if we could do that modification in the future. See, I have some uh, answers from John in the chat, just from Thanks, some John. of the other questions. Right. One person, yeah, so I just wanted to, someone asked a question. Um, 
it, the form does require two approvers. It technically can be the same approver if it starts somewhere else because uh, both can be the same because it depends on who you just put in. You, we are putting in the email address and the approver um, in the email. And that's who gets the email. So. And I think that I'm just making sure I think some of these are, are repeat questions. So I just want to make sure that everyone has some great information. Uh, again, just to, re just to recap, again, if you have a degree work access or advising access, you'll be able to get to the form. If for some reason you're having trouble, please connect directly with your uh, with us and we can maybe get IT involved if need be. Um, again, lots of questions specific to gen eds and, and different programs. Um, and I think that really kind of most of these are repeats. So I just want to. Yes, the meeting is recorded. We can get that. You can you can find that. They're coming in fast and heavy at the end. So I'm just I, making sure. I have to. This is I think the most well attended webinar we've had. I love so it. This is I'm I'm thrilled that you are all so interested because this is a a process we've spent many many months getting ready to move into production, and we are planning to have this live in production tomorrow, which is Friday, December first. Um, just one of the other person, another question was asked, why are there two approvers or if somebody can deny later? I think the key to any course substitution, if it was a paper form, again, as we reminder, or if it's an electronic form, communication is still key. So, like, if a PC or DC approves it and gets to a dean and let's say, like, dean's kind of questioning it, it's more likely just instead of denying or approving them calling and having that conversation, someone just asks why um, somebody is allowed to deny later when someone has already approved. Um, but again, it doesn't change the process of still working with your colleagues and, and uh, calling them up or emailing them if you have questions. It's just a, a nice way for us to be able to organize and keep track and keep that data for student for students to be able to be serviced properly. Um, I think. Um, I think that might kind of all these questions kind of. I uh, hit it again, specific questions. Just want to repeat specific, specific questions about campus programs. So on, we can connect afterwards. So I don't want you to think we're ignoring those. Sure. And I think there was a question is, does this essentially mean that we are removing the paper work form, the, work, yeah. the paper document? Uh, we are not removing the paper document. However, we're hoping that the more people become comfortable with the electronic form, the less the paper form will be needed. I mean, eventually we would love to have all of our forms electronic. Um, as again, it, it, I think it also creates a, a paper trail of where forms are located. So sometimes in, in the workflow process, you, you could submit a course substitution expected to be done and call your degree works team member and they've never received it because it's still waiting on someone's paper queue to approve. So I, ideally, the goal will be to move to the electronic so we know exactly where it is in the flow. It's a much easier document for students. Uh, we're not there yet since we're just launching the form, but with the goal of keeping the paper form as an option, but strongly encouraging individuals to use the electronic flow. And there are many more electronic forms to come. I can tell you exactly which ones are here. I know there was a question in there about that. Um, so please uh, keep an eye out of different forms. We're trying our best to get through this. And uh, John and Rusty and the Highland team have been working really hard on this uh, to get different forms up and running. So okay, there was a question about can the degree works team member overrule a dean? No. Uh, that is a, that is a no. Um, the, the degree works team merely takes the information they've received from the dean and process it, processes it or not, depending if the dean has had final approval. So, the degree work specialist is not overriding a decision. They are they are processing the decision that was made. Um, another question that came in just as they're coming as as we're finishing up. Yeah. Our courses, do, our course descriptions required for CT State courses are just courses outside of CT State. If there is a course description that's required there for either one. So again, we can reevaluate depending on that, but it's good to put them them in there. I don't know if anybody saw anything that I missed question wise as they were coming in. Really, really fast. And there were many, um, many questions flowing there, through that there, chat. There is so. a comment actually, um, and um, our our colleague Susan Wind, who is a director of degree audit technology, has made a very valid point. The degree works team may not be able to enter a substitution if it has to do with a CPOS alert. 
So that is the one thing, again, that would require the team going back to the dean for more information. It's not a denial. It's a going back for clarification because we, we the student, it needs to fit, in, fit into the student's program of study. So that would be, again, more further conversation with the campus. I wouldn't call it a denial. I would call it a review with the dean. Um, and some people are asking about who to contact if they have uh, specific questions about CPOS. We can connect with you about that. Um, again, I don't know if anybody wants to look at it. If it depends on what the process is, again, there are people right on campuses through financial aid, enrollment services, guided pathways that can help directly with CPOS. Okay. Looks like the questions have stopped. <laughs> This is great. I'm really happy everyone is so engaged in this and we are we are very happy to be able to share this with you. We we spent a long time coming and we appreciate your patience. We don't like to launch something until it's been well tested and we want to make sure it's ready and it, it is. So we are very happy to share it with you. It will be live tomorrow. I can't give you an official time, but it will be live tomorrow in production on that advisor card um, in my CT state. And, uh... Oh, there sorry. was one. Sorry. There was one more just comment, and I want, and I think it's a great comment. Again, twelve college. I, I mean, one college degree works is a, a reminder. And then also, please mention to these uh, only apply to program student is currently in, not what they're looking to do in the future. Right. So keep that yeah. in mind. So thank you for that. Um, but I think that actually rounded us out. Great point. Okay, and I just want to say this was recorded. It'll be up on ccstate.edu slash webinars um, either later today or tomorrow. And the slide deck will also be up. So if you couldn't, if you wanted to take another look at some of the slides that were up or zoom in on them a little bit, that will be up uh, for you to access as well. And thank you, everybody. Thank you all for your time you, and patience. And, and we look forward to hearing how well this form is working for you as of tomorrow. So thank you all for your time. All right. Excellent. Have a great day. Enjoy your day, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.